Charna Davis Weesey, and welcome to UCF in print. Do you have an image of early American women as uneducated and illiterate? Well, you won't believe some of the things they did and thought about, and we know because a lot of them wrote about it. And UCF professor Dr. Lisa Logan is getting the word out with her work. Thanks so much for joining us. One of my favorite people. We have such a good time talking <laughs> about these things. And this is something I can't wait to do this show because it's, I know so little about this. And I think most people do. Before we actually get into it, what turned you on to this? What, what, how did you discover early American women and their writings? I think it was something that I was always interested in because I can remember when I was in third grade and I discovered the library at my school. I went and checked out all the biographies of the women that were in the series first. And then I read all the historical novels that were about women. Um, but I really didn't read many early American women writers until I was in graduate school, all, even though I went to an all-women's college. There were only two women American writers that I ever read, Emily Dickinson and Anne Bradstreet, until I got to graduate school. Then when I got to graduate school, I can still remember, and this really started all of my work, I can still remember when um, on the syllabus the teacher gave us Mary Rowlandson, who wrote a captivity narrative in 1676. Now she and was a slave? She was, um, she was a white woman who lived in Lancaster, Massachusetts, and she was married to the minister in Lancaster, so she was the most prominent woman in the town. And she felt captive? And no. She, <laughs> oh, what I'll happened? get this one of these days. I <laughs> no. told you I don't know anything about this. Um, <laughs> what happened was that uh, they were in a war. It was the middle of King Philip's War, which was actually considered the bloodiest war percentage-wise that we've ever had in this country, even more so than um, the Civil War. But you never hear about King Philip's War. Um, anyway, in that war, her the village of Lancaster was attacked, and she was taken captive. There comes the captivity. Yes. Okay. Um, one of her, um, and, and she was actually the most valuable captive because she was the minister's wife, which meant she was the most important woman in the village. She was the first lady. That's right. And so, um, but I can still remember going to um, read that and being so excited about reading this woman who was really the first American writer who was writing a prose narrative. And it was a sensational book. It was something that was read to shreds. It was in so many editions. Um, and it was just devoured by people at the time and then for centuries thereafter. Um, but I remember reading it and I finished it and I thought, well, where is she? I, I can't really find her. I, can't, I don't really understand who she is. And I kept reading it and reading it and trying to figure out who she was because I just couldn't tell from reading it. And then that actually became the subject of my research. How do women negotiate being in print um, and, and their own position in culture and then um, what's important to them? Especially that. They, she wasn't supposed to be writing, was she? No, no, but you can, I, you know that she read because she was probably educated. Her parents were wealthy. Um, she was um, born here in, the, in uh, Massachusetts, I believe. Um, but um, women who were here at that time were usually, um, if they, if they were from landowning families, they were educated. Um, why do you think? You know, why was it okay for them to be educated? Is it just that they had the money to do it and the wherewithal to do it? Well, it's not like you went anywhere to be educated. You, you were tutors? educated at home mm -hmm. by usually your father and your mother. Okay, and um, we didn't have TV. No, <laughs> so, didn't have anything. <laughs> so, um, and books were very expensive and rare. And so, um, if you were the daughter of an educated man like Anne Bradstreet was, then you would have access to a library. Or if your father worked for um, a wealthy man, you would have access to a library. But there, there wasn't a school or anything that you could go to. And there was okay. no mass printing for books. To, that's why books were so expensive. Um, yeah, it was a very expensive process to print. 
and um, things didn't hold up as well. So we don't have the first edition of Mary Rowlandson's narrative. But what you find is that in that period, um, especially somebody Mary Rowlandson, uh, she was what we would consider, I guess, middle class, all right? And um, she wrote because something unusual happened to her. And what happened to her actually um, displaced her, not just in terms of geography, and she was toured all around um, Indian territory, okay? And it, uh, she wasn't sure from one day to the next if she would live, if her husband were still alive. Uh, her captors would tell her things that weren't true. Um, but the one thing about her writing is that because she was taken captive, they had ideas in her home culture. Um, what did she do to deserve this? Um, they believed, although this was strictly um, what white men did in war, um, they, the, uh, her, her culture believed that women who were taken captive by Indians would have been raped. Um, they would have thought that she would have adopted Indian waves and gone native, if you will. And so there are a lot of reasons for her to write this narrative that had to do with renegotiating her position once she was redeemed. So uh, she went from being the most prominent woman in her culture, in her village, to someone who um, was very suspicious. What did she do when she was with the Indians? And um, what sin did she commit that she deserved such captivity? And so, in some sense, her writing of the narrative was a way of renegotiating a place. You have to remember that when she got back, the village was no longer there, so her husband no longer had a job. So they were itinerant. They had to go around looking for minister posts for him. And then he died uh, within the year of her return. Um, they also had to spend a year trying to get their two older children back. The youngest child that was captive with her actually died of a gunshot wound to the stomach. So um, just incredible things that she endured. And, and so that story ends up in print. Um, and it's because of the print that we still have it, because it was so widely circulated, not just in this country, but in England. And England, it's funny, you know, how here we have movie trailers in England. Um, they used the cover page, and they would have what amounts to a trailer on the cover page, and it was very different in this country than it was in England, very sensationalized in England, whereas in this country, the printing made it seem like a very devout text that was went with a sermon, and um, it was all about what happened to this minister's wife who was really the handmaiden of God. Whereas in the British edition, it was the cruel torture and inhumane, you know. They so, had tabloids even yes, then. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. That's exactly what this was. So that, I guess what I want to say is that if a woman had something unusual happen to her or if she was highly educated, um, then um, we tend to know about it. Because the process of early American women writing is um, that they wrote, but their stuff is lost. And, and then we recover it, and then it's lost again because people say it's not important. And so that's really what I do is try to recover it and find a way to keep it. For them to write at that time as well, you know, something that I, I, I saw from one of your courses where um, it said in 1645, Governor John Winthrop pointed out that women's writing could lead to madness. Yes. <laughs> you don't do it, you're going to go nuts. Right. And Anne Bradstreet's sister actually was excommunicated. Um, that's part of that story. Um, women weren't allowed to, in the 1600s, uh, Puritan women weren't expected to speak out about certain things. So you shouldn't have an opinion about spiritual matters. And it turns out that Anne Bradstreet's sister was going along in a coach talking about something that happened in church and she had a tendency toward this and her uh, she actually her husband ended up uh, separating from her and she was excommunicated from the church you don't hear that about Anne Bradstreet you know um, and Anne Bradstreet actually lived right across the street from Anne Hutchinson who was the most famous um, uh, of the antinomians and was exiled to Rhode Island and eventually died there, but um, was actually tried and persecuted by the Puritan elders for speaking out about what happened in the church. And so writing was sort of like doing that. When you look at Mary Rowlandson's text, what she is 
really talking about is how do I understand this horrible thing that happened to me and make sense of it in my world? And the way that you make sense of things if you're a Puritan is by thinking about how it's part of God's plan. So you know when something bad happens to us, like we get a traffic ticket, we get in a car accident, um, something, something else calamitous happens, and then we think, all right, well, how do I make sense of this? Why did this happen to me? Um, how is this a good thing? What have I learned from this? And this, this is what Puritans did all the time. They believed that there was a plan for each of them, and the, the problem was that God was um, way out there making the plan, and they didn't have access to the plan, but they were always trying to read signs to understand the plan. And so how could she understand her captivity and deliverance as um, part of that sign system. And so the captivity became almost like the um, captivity of the Israelites, okay? And her redemption became like the redemption of the Israelites out of the desert. By doing that, by trying to understand it, probably is the only way they can gain any kind of control over it. Exactly, exactly. And that's what I talk about, is the process of negotiation. And I talk about it in terms of agency. Like, she is part of a culture. She's negotiating that culture. And it's not like she's outside of the culture saying, how can I get power here? She's in the culture. And she's just trying to think about how she can um, sort of negotiate the place that makes her comfortable. And we have to remember that she was most comfortable as a minister's wife, you know? Um, and she really wants to get that back. Um, one of the things we didn't know about her until very recently was that um, after her husband died, she remarried, and she lived another 20 or 30 years after she wrote this narrative, but nobody knows anything about her. Oh, because there, there's no record? She right. Didn't write she married about. a captain, Samuel Talbot, and, um, you know, had this rich life. At one point was called to testify because her son obviously didn't learn the same lesson of captivity. <laughs> um, and he was in trouble for trying to um, steal somebody's land and, and uh, sending the guy off to uh, the Caribbean as a slave. <laughs> He's a, a slimy guy, huh? <laughs> yeah, apparently. We'll talk more when we come back. We'll be right back. Okay. Greatness doesn't care how early it is, or how late. Greatness doesn't care if anyone's watching. Greatness doesn't care about your clothes, your hair, or your music. The only thing greatness cares about is getting an opportunity. Where will you get yours? At UCF, we believe no dream is too big and no goal out of reach. On the fields, the courts, and in the classrooms, UCF stands for opportunity. We're talking with Dr. Lisa Logan, and we're talking about early American women writers. Now, uh, we, the one, we talked about Mary Jameson and Bradstreet, women of means. There are also other kinds of women that wrote, and you've got, I, I love the cover <laughs> of this. This is a book about pirates. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, these women, these women didn't actually write, um, but they are talked about in writing of the period. So this is a children's book. The I don't know where to hold it, but the That's Ballad good. of the <laughs> Pirate Queens. And you can see it's lavishly illustrated. And um, I'll find, this is the Pirate Queens as grandmothers. <laughs> <laughs> Not the grandmas um, we're all used to, huh? <laughs> but it's actually it's about their place, and, and and they really were. You know, you don't think you never hear about the women when you. When That's you, right. When you uh, think about pirates, right? And they're very famous. Um, one of the things that I want to do is look at the importance of women to early American history. Okay, because they tend to be written out of that because they weren't. Um, part of the wars. They didn't become president and things like that. So um, what I've looked at is the trial transcript. Um, they were tried and convicted in Jamaica for piracy by um, in 1720, okay? And um, <laughs> the one woman, and the reason they didn't hang like um, Captain Jack, <laughs> who they were uh, on ship with, was because one of them pleaded her, they, they both pleaded their bellies. One of them actually was pregnant, and we think from the records it seems that she died in jail, 
the other, and so that was Mary Reed, but Anne Bonney, um, she, her father was a rich planter in South Carolina, and I think what happened is that he bailed her out and married her off. We have no record of what happened to her in jail, but there is somebody who really resembles her who ends up married to a South Carolinian. She ran away from him as a teenager. She just rebelled and um, dressed as a man. A lot, of the, um, a lot of the women you read about are, um, because you think about it, what can you do as a woman that would be worthy of a book? We well, have to be unusual, okay? And so there's a lot of books about women who cross-dressed. There's a lot of books of, uh, that are really fake biographies or fake autobiographies written by men about women doing these things, and I look at that too. So that's another way that we have evidence about what people thought about women. Um, and so I look at the trial transcript, and what's interesting about the trial transcript is that these women were so, um, they were so evil, according to all the witnesses. They wouldn't just have one gun, they'd have two guns. And so they were <laughs> and twice they'd have as evil as the male parents. And they'd have knives. And the, the thing is that it always had to do with their breasts. That was how they would dress in male clothing, but then after they made the kill, they would bare their <laughs> breasts and they, you know, so there was a way that they were sensationalized, yeah. all right? And the, thought, um, the, the, <laughs> the chance of that really happening probably was slim, however, it's the, their perception of how, or how the, the writers wanted them to be perceived. Um, well, these were trial witnesses. Oh, trying so they to, really did do that? Yeah, they were trying to get them convicted, and so we don't know, but they, they made them sound really evil, okay? Um, but it is the case that when that ship got captured by the British, um, that all the men were downstairs drinking, and it was the women who were on deck Scrubbing. fighting. Oh, fighting. <laughs> they were the ones fighting it off, because the captain was down there in his cups. <laughs> and so, and she said to, uh, I forget, it, I think it was Anne Bonney who said to Captain Jack Rackham, if you um, had fought like a man, you wouldn't have to hang like a dog. Good line. <laughs> <laughs> Good line. And it's funny, when you look at the cover of it as well, they kind of look more like Charlie's Angels. They're very huh? butch. They're very, yeah. yeah. And the <laughs> thing is that, um, that this is a very recent book, but if you look through the ages, there's an obsession with these women. And that's I what I I never knew there were about. pirate queens. Yeah. Well, Grace O'Malley's the famous British one that met Queen Elizabeth. So um, I work on those, and then yeah. um, this is one of the books I would have read as a child. It's called Indian Captive, and it's the story of Mary Jemison, who is known as the white woman of the Genesee. She um, was taken captive from what's now West Virginia when she was about 12 or 13, and she stayed. This was on the reading list for my son's yes. my son's English it class It won a Newbery year. Award. Yeah. It's a very, and this, but, but the boys don't read it. <laughs> I know. That's the thing about boys. They only they want to read to, about they boys. They need to assign them and make them read them. I know. <laughs> it's very sad. Um, but anyway, she was the white woman of the Genesee, and she stayed with her captors. Um, uh, the statistics show that if you're taken early as a child, you do end up acculturating and staying. But she married two different Seneca men. Um, the first one, I guess, died, and the other one um, she stayed with for quite a while, had several children, and remained with the Seneca. Then did this weird thing where, by claiming um, um, some U.S. citizenship, she was able to secure lands for her Seneca children, but she never returned. They, were, they asked her a few times, and she refused. And she lived to be in her 80s and was actually interviewed um, by uh, James Seaver, who was an anthropologist in the 18th century. So in 1823, he interviewed an 83 or so year old Mary Jemison, and that's the text we have about her life. And the discussion is how much of it did she really write or say, and how much of it is Seaver. And that's the thing, that's the negotiation again that every text, in my view, is sort of a collaboration between the woman and the cultural forces that, um, that I guess, coalesce um, for her to get into print, all right? And then this other book, um, it's uh, edited by Ann Taves, but it's the memoirs of Abigail Abbott Bailey, who 
had uh, 17 children by a very abusive man. And 17 children. Yes, and um, she was pregnant forever. She and she was married to him for almost 20 years, and um, that she was always pregnant. And what happened to solidify? She actually won a divorce and a property settlement in the 1700s. Amazing. Okay? It's it's so rare. There must have been a lot of witnesses. Right. <laughs> well, what happened was um, when she was pregnant with, I think her. Six, 15th and 16th children who were twins, she was confined to bed rest and he began um, raping their elder daughter, Phoebe, okay? And she knew this was going on but couldn't prevent it because she was confined to bed rest. And so um, what happened as a result of that though is that she did eventually win a property settlement um, because of all the terrible things he did. After that, um, Phoebe left, and she always used the church to gain some authority. So these memoirs are actually collected in the church and were published by the church, and they're a record of her faith and um, the way that her faith helped her to survive these awful circumstances of a, a husband who was, he philandered and then he um, abused her personally and then sexually abused at least that one child. But the, the real thing that he did that I talk about is he told her that in order to get a property settlement, she would have to go into New York where they had different laws and he had a buyer for their land. So he took her there and he said it would be like a two week trip. And this is in um, the 1770s sometime. And uh, they get there and she quickly realizes that he has no intention to return her, all right? And that he's going to leave her in the wilderness of New of York, New York. Um, without any way to get home. He forbids her from writing. And so what she does, she's very smart. She um, gets him to tell her all of the towns that they pass through in order to get into New York to meet the buyer. And um, he does, and she says, because I want to tell the children when I see them, she when was they come. She suspicious of him yeah. before they even got she there. She knew that she would never see them again if he had his way. And so he tells her, and she says, but you know, my memory's bad. Could you just write the towns down for me? Because I really want, I really want to talk to the children about these towns when I see them again. And he does. So she has this little scrap of paper, and it's got all the towns listed. And then she's in an inn, and she gets an innkeeper to give her a pen, and she writes a hymn from a little book that's in the, the room. Um, so she's not allowed to read, she's not allowed to write, but she's got this little scrap of paper. And when her husband abandons her, she has nothing but the scrap of paper. She has one dollar, and she has two shoe buckles, okay, and a bolt of cloth. She gets all the way back to her home. Um, with nothing but this. And her good name, you know, she goes along and says, can I borrow a horse? Here, I can trade you the shoe buckle. Here's the next town I need to get to. I'm a woman of much faith. And, and it's her sort of cachet as a pious woman that enables her to get the help from people to get from town to town all the way home. He's very surprised to see her. I was her. just going to say, he must have been shocked. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been shocked. Is, any, is there anything written about his reaction? Um, it, Don't, no, even have no to. that's not in the court <laughs> records, but he does lose that battle. And they, they cast him out, you know, because of what he tried to do, all right? And then there's another woman in this book. There's actually four women, Mary Rawlinson, uh, Sarah Campbell Knight, who traveled um, from Boston to New Haven in 1804, I'd say. Um, no, sorry, 1704. And then um, Elizabeth Ashbridge, who became a Quaker and suffered domestic abuse from her husband, and then Elizabeth House Trist, who went from Philadelphia to Natchez in 1763. And then later, again, when her son was appointed a tax collector in Natchez. Unbelievable. There's so much out there. I think we could do like three or four hours. Unfortunately, <laughs> we're out of time. But um, if people want to go ahead and Google it, Google early American women, go to the library. 
Uh, really Email amazing. Me. Email <laughs> Dr. Lisa Logan at UCF and she will tell you what to read. So wonderful that we have people like you ferreting this out to get this information out because it's a vital part of history and it's, it would be a shame if it was lost. Dr. Lisa Logan, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks, I know we'll Charna. probably come back again because we have so much more to talk about. <laughs> oh, thanks, Charna. <laughs> I'm Charna Davis-Wiese. Thank you so much for joining us on UCF In Print, and we'll see you again next time.